Welcome to Below the Line, where we talk about working in film and television from the crew perspective. My name is Skid. I was an assistant director in Hollywood for the better part of eight years, and now I'm not. Today, we're talking about 2019's Ford v. Ferrari. Regular listeners know that we spoke with crew from Ford v. Ferrari last episode, and if you're not a regular listener, I recommend you go back and listen to that episode first. Because today, we're focusing specifically on the stunt aspects of the film. And my guest is Robert Nagel, the stunt coordinator. Robert's been driving stunts for more than 17 years, has more than 80 credits to his name, and in 2015, he and Alan Paddleford received an Academy Award for technical achievement. Robert, welcome to Below the Line. Thanks for having me. Now, Robert, we're going to treat that mention of the Academy Award as a teaser and come back to that later in the conversation. How did you get involved with Ford v. Ferrari? It's a project that had been around for a while, and so I kind of had my sights on it. But a good friend of mine, the second unit director, Darren Prescott, I got called in for a meeting and he called me and said, Hey, I just left this meeting about this film and he had dropped my name for them to talk to me. And, uh, it was probably a week later. I got a personal text message from James Mangold to come in and meet with him on the film. And we sat down and talked for about an hour about the film and, uh, my thoughts on it. And about what stage in this was this during pre-production about how much time did you have lead before the filming actually started? This was probably, I'm going to say, three months before we went to camera. Oh, okay. And it still wasn't 100% greenlit. It was kind of like, we're going, we think we're going, we're not sure. So, yeah. And I want to explore a little deeper. When we talked with folks last week, they talked about primary filming being done in Los Angeles, but a lot of the stunt work being done in Georgia. Could you talk more about the relationship between you, the second unit director, Darren Prescott, as you mentioned, and then, of course, the director, James Mangold, how the three of you worked together to bring this vision of racing. James kind of left it up to Darren and I to put together all the car stuff uh, because he's he's not a, you know, quote unquote, car guy. He kind of looked to us to to carry that and uh, worked with him closely in designing the, the races and even some of the technical stuff of, you know, what a race car driver is and who that person is, just giving him different insights to that. So it was a, it was a great relationship between me, Darren, and uh, James Mangold in, in putting this together. Now, can you talk a little bit more about uh, your background, Robert? I know that you come out of the racing world yourself. Is that accurate? That is correct, yeah. And uh, a lot of the other folks you brought in, were they also folks with previous racing experience? So for this particular project, I knew, I wanted guys that um, were ex pro racers because I did. There was an expectation of driving level that I needed uh, from everybody, and to be able to still have a you know sort of a safety margin, if you will. So I needed the limiting factor to be you know whatever the car's level is. That's that's his, that's our level, meaning the the driver can take it. You know it, his skill level is way beyond the car, and that's what I needed for the core group. Of drivers, there was also uh, a small group of guys that I affectionately called my stunt or my crash dummies mm-hmm. uh, for the for the crash sequences. But they're also you know quite accomplished drivers in themselves. But they're more for for the stunt work you know that you'd traditionally consider stunt work. I see. I see. Is it safe to assume that second unit was exclusively in Georgia, or did second unit also operate in Los Angeles as well? It operated in Los Angeles as well. Okay. Um, okay. But uh, it was it was exclusive to Georgia, meaning first unit didn't come to Georgia and do anything. Right. Did these run simultaneously? And so I'm trying to get a sense of where you needed to be for the course of the filming. If you can help me understand a little better about how this was spread between the two coasts and just sort of how it broke down. You know, there was a lot of careful planning, and so that um, I could be focused on the race sequences for second unit and not be needed. Uh, main unit. So there was only a crossover of a handful of days where I needed to kind of be two places at once. Um, but uh, spent a fair amount of time in, in scheduling everything out so that uh, I could take care of uh, both units. Well, that makes sense. Almost scheduling around your availability is, is critical in figuring out what can be shot when. You being where the racing is taking place is really important for this one. Yeah. And it, uh, and it you know, it, it also uh, revolved heavily around just availability of some of these uh, locations. Mm-hmm. Um, and that sort of, that sort of, that sort of became the, the pivot point for everything. You know, we, you can only have this location on these three days. Well, then now, you know, as an AD, you know, you know, as an AD, then you've got to plan around that. 
And that's kind of where it started it. So clearly our focus is on the, on the racing, but what about the other stunt work in the film? Was that purposely scheduled when there wasn't other racing going on? In other words, you didn't need to be in Georgia or was some of it small enough that you could delegate that if you will? Yeah, it was sort of a mix of the two. I mean, just depending on what uh, the actual gag was, oftentimes it, it was a, it was a minor thing that I could set everything up and, and hand it off to one of my other guys to kind of oversee it uh, without me being there. I but see. that was only a few occasions. For the for the most part, I was available to oversee most everything. You know, it's just I like guess a testament to the scheduling of this whole project and and the planning that went into it. Now, there's one notable, uh, what I would call a stunt sequence that doesn't involve cars, and that's where our two leads are wrestling in the grass. Was that a lot of coordination? Did you work with those guys, either the principals or stunt yeah. doubles on that? That seems it's a pretty yeah, intense no. scene, all things considered. There was, a, there was a lot involved in it, as silly as it seems. I and mean, it was actually one of my favorite scenes to do, um, even though it's, you know I'm a car guy and it's a car movie because it was such a departure um, from what you would normally see for a fight scene. I worked with the doubles to, to choreograph that whole thing. And we came up with a, with what I think was a pretty good uh, little fight sequence. Um, and like I said, out of the norm. And uh, it was finding that fine line between it should be a little comedic, but you should get the point that these guys are pretty pissed off at each other. But you also, also don't want to cross over into Three Stooges. And so my whole premise uh, when I started with this is that this is like a sixth grade schoolyard fight. And uh, kind of built it from there. But there was a funny moment as I was showing the, the choreography to Christian and Matt. It occurred to me that I have uh, Batman and Jason Bourne here with me. And uh, <laughs> by the way, guys, you don't know how to fight now. So let's forget all that. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have to deprogram them from all their other training yeah. as far as those characters. You know, when you speaking of that fight, I think there's a really nice character moment where I forget who's at the bottom of the moment. I think it's um, I think it's Shelby, but he goes to grab groceries. He grabs a can, but then drops yes. it and just grabs the bread instead. And I'm curious, was that scripted or is that something you guys sorted out with this idea of what you were trying to do? That was part of our choreography. Yeah, okay, you know, just right. coming up with you know different different ideas and and from the get go, Mangold loved just loved that moment. You know, because there's that right. you know I could hit him with this, no, and then grab something else. You developed that through the choreography. It wasn't something that was in the literal written script it's supposed to happen. You probably Correct. started with a simpler guidance there. Yeah, it was basically just, you know, there's a fight. That's really what was in the script. There's a fight. Uh, and, you know, there's little descriptions to it, but we kind of just, you know, built up a, a version. No, I was going to say compliments on that, because just to your point, it's funny, but it also drives the character of these guys and their relationship that even though they're fighting, you know, they're not trying to bloody each other. They're just uh, in a disagreement. Yeah. That was nicely done. Thank you. It was a fun one to do. <laughs> so, um, as you mentioned earlier, that was fun, not involving the cars. Let's turn our attention to the race scenes themselves and tell me a little more about what it takes to bring together all these various elements. So we've got three major races. I don't know whether you want to talk about them separately, Robert, or there's just sort of general themes about doing the multi-car races overall that you'd like to share. Well, they were all, you know, they're all different. And I wrote a story for each one of them. And that's, that was kind of our guidebook uh, to keep track of things. Um, and it started with the Willow Springs race. And everything I wrote was written from Ken's perspective. Because uh, obviously that's how we're going to see it. Um, but the race plays out. When I wrote it out, it just it plays out from his perspective. And that way you can kind of follow along where everything is happening, when it should be happening. And then turn that into storyboards and or uh, previs. Okay. Oh, and that's interesting. So the Willow Springs race from Ken's perspective, and then you storyboard it out and then grab the specific bits that are needed to actually deliver the race on the screen. That makes sense. Yeah. And was there a different approach then to the Daytona of 24, which is really a Ford versus Ford race? It was the same thing, just writing the, the, the story of the race. Um, there were some pieces that are already in the script that I would fit into that narrative. And again, it just it gives us uh, a guidebook of uh, when we go to shoot it and keeping everything in sync became more and more, far more important for the Le Mans race. And we can get into that when you want. Sure. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the Le Mans race. Now, I know using Georgia, because even Le Mans doesn't look like Le Mans did then. If you were to try to film on act, the actual location, the roads would not, it wouldn't have the same characters as the actual race in 66. Yeah, it looks nothing like it, like it did. 
And so um, with the Georgia, were you involved in the scouting as well, as far as finding these locations and then determining what would work? I'm presuming that's a big part of putting that race together. No, yeah, it absolutely was involved in all the, the scouting for that because it is, you know, there's conditions I need met for the roads uh, that somebody else may not see it the same way. But, you know, the, it has to look, it has, it has to have the visual look uh, to begin with, and then it has to have what I need for safety and speed uh, for the cars. And but uh, we found uh, some great places. It uh, certainly looks that way on screen. Tell me more about putting together those sequences. For example, if we're shooting a couple of actors in a room, we might shoot it wide and then shoot them up close. If you're seeing a group of cars driving, you have all these different beats of that sequence. Do you break it down similarly, trying to shoot wide stuff first, or is it really chasing the small bits that are going to come together and, and make a greater whole? I mean, we covered all of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I wouldn't say one preceded the other. Mm -hmm. I think it just depended on the light for the day and, and where the DP wanted to start. Uh, it wasn't like a hard, fast, like, oh, we need to start with our wide and get all that coverage. And it seemed to be more light dependent for him on what we were covering. I see. So you basically have a punch list of things you know you need to get, whether it's the, the wides or the tights or the, the individual moments. And you're just collecting what you can based on the day, just about how long things take and Correct. How, how things fall into place. Yeah. And we maybe, you know, you know, maybe for like an insert shot or a rig car rig shot, maybe that's being uh, prepped and rigged while we're doing a, you know, a wide shot with, with a different car and so on and so forth. Now, speaking of the rigs and such, can you tell me some more about the um, special rigs that you guys use to capture some of this? So, you know, there's a few uh, different setups that we had. First off, uh, the special effects department put the, you know, built this uh, high-speed camera car with the, this enormous exterior cage uh, to protect the driver. Uh, we had Alan in, in that driver's seat. Um, and it was designed specifically uh, for that big crash sequence that happens just past the... Uh, the Dunlop Bridge, uh, where we actually launch a car about 300 feet so that we uh, begin cartwheeling when it hit the ground. The plan was for it to hit the ground next to uh, the camera car that they had built. And uh, we took uh, two takes. On the second take, uh, the car that we launched uh, righted itself after it tumbled a bit and T-boned the, uh, the camera car pretty hard, sent him into a concrete wall. So it, it did its job. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 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 Yeah. Um, <laughs> So there's that rig, uh, and we, we, we affectionately called it uh, Frankenstein because they just kept adding stuff to it as, as time went on. And then there's the, uh, there was a, uh, like a, a pod car that they built uh, for front end, just the front end of a GT40, and uh, we used that for a, some of the shots. But for uh, all the actor stuff, we used the, the Biscuit Jr., and we had a couple different configurations of that. One was for the Willow Springs race with a Cobra on it, and the remainder of the races was uh, the GT40 that we mounted, just the shell of a GT40 to the Biscuit Junior uh, in what we call a wheels down configuration, meaning you can you could be outside the car looking down the car and you, the back tire is, is really there and it's on the ground. And so the, ch the rear chassis of the GT40 uh, is all visible. Uh, with Christian in the car. So you can see him, you can see the car, you can see the ground. And that allows me to bring other cars right up next to him as wow. well in camera. Uh, Robert, this is probably a good time to talk about your Academy Award because you mentioned the Biscuit Junior. And for folks who don't know, it's a self-propelled, high-performance, drivable camera and vehicle platform. Now, I know it got its origins back with Seabiscuit back in 2003. Uh, Alan Paddleford uh, did it for that movie. I was an AD on that movie, although I didn't work with oh, uh, those aspects. But uh, yeah, I was there when it was starting. But over time, how did you get involved um, in the evolution of the technology? And then tell me more about from 2003 to now, what you guys have put together. So the original one you just spoke of for that was built for Seabiscuit, you know, they, they, they dubbed it the USS Seabiscuit um, <laughs> because it was just enormous. And then it went on to work for Aviator, where they mounted an aircraft fuselage on it for some of the scenes with Leo. And while they were filming, I think it was up in Santa Clarita area, brush fire came through and burnt down base camp and, it, and burnt everything, all the equipment, including uh, Alan's uh, original biscuit, were completely destroyed. Uh, so a couple of years after that, he contacted me and said, hey, I want to build a different version of this. Let's put our heads together and come up with something. And this is what we came up with is the, the Biscuit Junior. 
And so tell us more about how that works and the advantages of having this rig that you can put a car, as you said, several different cars, some of them can actually be on the road. Tell us more about what's gained by, by doing this. The, the big advantage it has is that the, the, what we call the drive pod, meaning where the stunt driver actually drives this platform from, uh, is, is movable, meaning it could be mounted at the front, uh, it could be mounted in the back, mounted you know, wherever, out of, out of view of camera. So now you, you have the option of being able to pan forward, look forward with the actor and not know that you're on a rig. And that's, you know, that's what sort of set it apart, uh, was actually being able to get that kind of shot. So you could actually, you know, look not quite 360 degrees. I'll, I'll say be generous and say 270 uh-huh. minimum with a pod mounted, you know, out of view of a camera. And for a movie like this, how fast are you running that vehicle? Um, I think... I believe we're around 130, 140. Wow! With the uh, with the biscuit rig yeah, going around uh, uh, for the Daytona race, uh, you know, we were going pretty fast. And at those speeds, then it, presumably you have the actor in the in the car on the rig, and then you have a driver. But there probably are not additional folks traveling with the unit at that speed. That's correct. Uh, yeah, it, all the cameras are either fixed uh, or remotely operated. Got it. But yeah, in a certain situation like that, it's certainly not a, a manned uh, camera. When you were working with Alan to develop it, what sort of movies were you using it on? Like, what else in the past has, has seen the use of this vehicle? Um, it's pretty extensive. I mean, mm-hmm. the, the first car movie it went on uh, was uh, the first uh, Hangover uh, with the, uh, the Mercedes scenes. Okay. Uh, where you see them, you know, handing off the tuxedo and when they're on their way to Vegas and so on and so forth. Uh, we used it on drive very extensively. All the chasing, including the low speed chasing on drive, we used that rig to, to shoot with. And it just, it's one of those things that you allow the actor to do just act and let us do the driving. And it, it comes together quite seamlessly. Agreed. So returning to the race at Le Mans, are there specific stunts in that sequence that stick in your mind? I'm thinking whether there's the car spin out the beginning. You mentioned that car that you guys launched out of the Frankenstein rig. What other stunts do you remember as being particularly harrowing or interesting or not quite what you expected? They were all, I mean, they all came together as I expected. <laughs> oh, well, um, good. That's probably good to know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that, yeah. I mean, really, the, the toughest one is really the, the one where we launched the car. The, the timing of keeping getting the thing to land where we want it to land and having the other cars ahead of it and behind it uh, and still being somewhat safe, uh, although it's still a precarious position, especially the ones that were behind it. Right. There's a lot of planning and timing uh, and preparation going into that. What about like driving in the rain? I know that some cars crash into hay bales and that. Did you guys have rigs or did you actually wait for it to start raining out there? How'd you guys have to time that? Typically, we we made it rain. Um, right. There were there were times that it, you know we did. Get, get a little help from nature, but <laughs> it was it, it was all us pretty much uh, creating the rain. And um, I'm also thinking about uh, when some of those crash scenes, like when the Ferrari 20 crashes into hay bales and such, stationary cameras on the side, are you guys setting that out multiple ways? Or is this a, a sequence that, yes, it's a crash, but you know because you've worked with both directors about exactly what you're trying to capture for these scenes before you actually do it? Yeah, I mean, we walk through it pretty pretty extensively and know pretty well where the car is going to impact. And so, you know, set up uh, crash cameras for that. And I think we had a techno crane uh, mm. that was, yeah, I think we had a big, I want to say it was a 45-foot techno that kind of uh, tracked with the car as it glanced off the embankment and then spun around and set itself up to get T-boned. Well, those are the race sequences in this movie are, are are fantastic. I have to say that when I went back and counted again, and there there are just the three races, it's still they're done so well, Robert. It really permeates the entire film, which I think is the intent. And uh, much credit to how those came together. Thank you. I appreciate it. It was a lot of work and uh, you know big team effort, and um, and I think you know part of it was you know having the uh, the guys with the racing experience um, really uh, paid off, and uh, that way you know I kind of give them a shorthand of what I'm, I need at a given moment. And they know exactly what I'm talking about. I bet. How large was the stunt team, particularly for the racing sequences? So we had a core group of, I think, like 20 or 22 
uh, what I call pro drivers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and kind of, you know, some of them could stay on the whole time. Some of them had to come and go. And then, uh, then I had my two, uh, crash dummies, um, that stayed on for the, the other room of the film. But yeah, it was about 20, 22, uh, you know, kind of a core group of drivers. And what was the period of time for filming the race scenes? Like, for example, you said you did them individually, but was it about a month on each, two months overall? Like, how much effort goes into what obviously is a huge part of the film, but is not the entire film, obviously? Uh, I think we were in Georgia for just over three weeks. Oh, that's all. Okay, so that, you guys were but working very for, focused and intently during uh, that time. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was running gun, uh, big time to get it done. Very, very compressed schedule for that. Wow. Um, Will, Willow Springs, I think we spent a couple of weeks on that, but it was also integrating with first unit. Okay. So, you know, it kind of runs at a different pace with first unit. They told us last week that the Le Mans um, starting area and the pits was built. Was that a focus of the stunts as well? In other words, was your entire stunt team there for all of those scenes that, that go by the crowd and such? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Anytime the cars are at speed, uh, it's a, you know, it's those guys. And even when it's you know, it being used as just a set piece, and now the cars are you know, for lack of a better word, just a background piece. But they're still barreling through there between 100 and 150 miles an hour in the background. Impressive. Now we've talked a little bit about the racing specifically. I want to talk about some of the stunt work that's not the racing, but where they do have the racing cars. And I'm thinking about all the test track scenes where there's a lot of close-ups of the principal. The principal is key, obviously, to the scene. And there's a number of scenes where this takes place, but you're really still moving at extremely high speeds. I'm wondering what, whether it's the Biscuit Junior or whether you had other techniques for capturing these moments. Yeah, that, so the majority of that was, uh, when you see the principal actors, uh, that was shot on the Biscuit rig, especially the, uh, the scene with Matt and, uh, and Henry Ford. That one, yeah, where they're, uh, where Shelby is making clear to Henry Ford just what he's gotten himself into and what the car's able to do. Um, yeah. Lots of close-ups, yeah. but then also lots of wide shots of the car itself. Presumably a stunt person and a dummy in for those, although it's hard to tell if there's actually two people in some of those shots on, shot that way. You can't tell, yeah. It was, I'm pretty sure it was just uh, Tony, was our, Tony Hunt was our uh, driving double for uh, Christian Bale, and pretty much it's that when you see the wide when i say wide you're seeing the exterior of the car with the car is obviously being driven that's that's uh tony ken miles has uh two crash scenes the one where um it's at night the brakes catch fire he the car blows up behind him and there's another one which is final drive um obviously the one foreshadows uh the latter but uh what how did the, how did you execute on those scenes so the test track crash the, at night, that was a practical car that we uh, we slid, or Jer- Jeremy Fry was the driver for that, and uh, set it up so that it would spin coming off of one of the corners and hit the embankment at the far side, and worked out perfectly. Uh, had a nice impact, and then overlapped it with a pra- with a, an effects rig uh, that would explode. Hmm. So it was kind of it was kind of a match cut to. Uh, from what we did to the effects rig. When he's driving and the brakes start to fail and the wheels heat up, I'm not, I don't remember if there's literally flames or if it's just red. Is that also something you're working with special effects or is that something that visual effects has, is having a hand in? If that was more of a visual effect. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. They did have some stuff on there to, you know, so they could see what a, a glowing rotor might look like. But that, yeah, that was, that was a, uh, the effects. I see. So they had a hand in that as well, obviously, to bring all these elements together that, uh, that so you're working closely with them on those parts. Correct. Yep. And then I'd also like to get your insights or hear the stories about, and as we mentioned earlier, the non-race car driving scenes. Now you're not moving at race car speeds, but you also have a lot of elements, other cars, pedestrians, other things that you're working with. Immediately to mind comes when Molly, uh, Ken's wife, is driving on the road and as if she's a race car driver. You've got cars going both directions. Tell, tell me a little bit about setting that scene up. So it was just picking out uh, sections of road. Uh, that we could get uh, to kind of match the dialogue that's going on and, and what uh, James uh, Mangold wanted to occur at, you know, given moments uh, in that dialogue. So we shot it with the biscuit rig with the actors. And then we also had, then uh, Darren came back uh, as uh, second unit 
and shot the wide shots of, of the station wagon careening around and going around the traffic and whatnot. Oh, got it. So that was, uh, yeah, first unit got what they needed with the rig, and then Correct. Darren came in later with the second unit to, to, to fill in the rest of that. Yep, yep. And then matched what we did for, for first unit. Now, is it a similar approach to another scene? I'm, I'm thinking when the unhappy customer is leaving Ken Miles' shop, it seems comedic, but there are other cars moving around there. Like, clearly, this is a stunt coordinated moment, if not, uh, even if it doesn't seem that way, as with all the other stunt work going on. No, it's as silly as it seems. It is, you know, it's all very coordinated and, and timed out. So everybody knows what is happening when. But, you know, you don't want it to seem too stunty. Um, right. You want to see, you know, the guy can't really drive. And so you want that appearance as such. It's also um, Shelby leaving the doctor's office. Do you have a stunt driver in for that? Or did uh, Matt Damon do that himself? We had we had a version with, with, his, with a double. And we had a version with uh, Matt doing it. And uh, he's... He's quite handy in a car uh, from from his training in the uh, the Bourne movie, so I, I didn't worry about him too much. You mentioned that um, you had to have the actors scale it back a little on the fight scene when they bring their Jason Bourne and Batman personas uh, to the screen. What sort of driving skills did they bring, and how close did you have to work with them to make them these race car drivers? So, you know, like I said, Matt you know, came with some training, and there wasn't a lot of driving for him anyway. Um, so I felt very confident with him uh, getting in the cars. Of course, we always had his double there for the driving stuff as well. But with Christian, really wanted some in-depth training, and I know he really did. And so what I did is I took him out to Bob Bondurant School in Arizona for a week and uh, kind of shadowed the instructor to guide the, uh, the training the way I wanted it. And part of my why I wanted him to go out there is I was hoping uh, that he'd at least be able to meet Bob Bondurant, who's obviously a you know, huge icon from this era and a big part of this you know, story. And so what we wound up doing is uh, we were trained from, uh, I think we started at 7 or 7.30 in the morning, and we would train till 2, well, probably about 2, two o'clock in the afternoon. And by then it was you know, 115 degrees out. And what wound up happening is we then spent the next four to five hours every day sitting down talking to Bob Bondurant about his racing career. And what I didn't know is he was best friends with Ken Miles. So there was a huge wealth of information oh, wow. and insight for Christian, not only from a, you know, a very prominent race car driver, but also a friend of Ken Miles. So it was just a really amazing experience. And, uh, and I got to say, hands down, uh, Christian is the, is the best actor I've ever trained to drive. He did an amazing, amazing job. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. And as you say, what an opportunity to get to speak with someone that knew Ken Miles firsthand. What yeah. an amazing opportunity to set up there. It was, it was fantastic. I mean, I, I love, it's something I'll always cherish and look back on is the, the time I got to spend uh, just sitting down and talking with Bob Bondurant. And so, Robert, tell me a little more about your career as far as starting in racing, getting into stunts, and what a movie like this means to sort of revisit the, that era. I just, you know, I tried, you know, I kind of went through different phases of racing. I started with drag racing, got bored with that, got introduced to road racing, and was hooked immediately. But it just, you know, in doing this, I'd met guys that were already in the film world, and it sounded intriguing. And they a race movie came along and, and one of them uh, asked if I wanted to come work on it. And I said, sure. Cause they wanted, you know, kind of like what I've done is they wanted race car drivers driving these cars cause they were going to be driven at speed. And I really enjoyed it. And uh, I kind of left the racing world and haven't looked back. Cause one of the things that it opened up for me and what I didn't realize uh, was the creative side of this and designing all of this mm -hmm. and the problem solving and I really enjoy the creative side of it. It's very satisfying. And where, Robert, are we going to see your efforts next? There should be. We should be starting fairly soon. Don't have a start date yet. Uh, Baby Driver 2. Oh, wow. Oh, great, great. I enjoyed the first one. I'm, I'm glad to hear they're doing another it was, yeah. The first one was a lot of fun. So looking forward to number two. That can be a real challenge to sort of up the first one. The driving is really incredible in that film as it is. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sure you're working on it already, but uh, that's going to be a that's going to be a tough bar to to jump over. We'll we'll watch. Yes, that, yes, it is. Uh, appreciate it.
<laughs> Looking forward to it. And Robert, thanks for joining us here today. I've really appreciated you giving us some insight into the behind the scenes on Ford v. Ferrari. My pleasure. My pleasure. Listeners, I'd love to hear what you thought of the episode. You can send an email to skid, S-K-I-D, at below the line, one word, dot biz. That's B-I-Z. I also appreciate your feedback via iTunes, where I review your ratings and comments, and Facebook, where I post photos and other behind-the-scenes materials at Podcast Below the Line. Please do rate us and tell your friends. And if you're not already, follow us on Twitter and Instagram. On both platforms, search for Pod Below the Line. Thanks to Curtis Five for our music and John Juan for our logo. The logo is available on t-shirts, mugs, and stickers at redbubble.com. And finally, thank you, listeners, for listening. We're taking a short break for the balance of the winter holidays, but we'll be back in the new year with a series of special episodes that tie into award season. Should be fun. Join us there.